All right. So if you can just uh, settle back, we're going to have a wonderful conversation here this afternoon. We want everyone to relax and enjoy this. Um, we're also going to encourage you to use the chat if you have comments uh, or if you have questions. We're really going to have a discussion, a discussion with Carol Cecil and Liz Sweet. And as you know, um, Liz has just recently retired uh, from SAMHSA after an amazing lifetime of service there. And Carol Cecil is the wonderful person who is taking her role. So uh, we're so excited. We are so sad to see Liz leave, but we are so excited with the choice they made um, to represent families in the Office of Recovery. So we are going to start uh, with just a quick video. We're gonna be talking today about how children's mental health has gone from awareness to acceptance. And we put this together in a video we're going to share with you just to give you a very brief history. And then we are going to talk with Liz and Carol about this. So Kelsey, let's start our video. If you, your family member, and or your child of any age is living with a mental health and or substance use challenge, remember that you are not alone. Together, our team, along with our affiliates and partners across the nation, continue to advocate and provide services and supports to families in the hopes of becoming a country where anyone experiencing these challenges can live happy, fulfilling lives and be accepted as valued members of their communities. So now that we've given you just that brief introduction, we want to talk. We're going to go back to that beginning that you saw, and we're going to talk about when this idea of children's mental health awareness first came into being in Missouri. All right, Liz, I'm going to ask you to take us back to that very beginning, um, because I know you were... Uh, a part of that, you were in partnership with Barb and Barbara and those folks. Can you sort of set the stage for us? Sure. Um, back um, in the, uh, it was actually even before SAMHSA was an agency, um, the, the state of Missouri had provided some funding for the family organization in Missouri, um, which was a 
fledgling organization at that point um, to do some um, a PR around children's mental health. And so they were working on that. And then um, what happened was when CASP as a program was born, the state of Missouri used part of their CASP funding to say to the family organization, how would you like to um, send this message or get this information out to families? And so the, the, the families got together, they looked at, talked about what is it that they could do. And what, what, they, came, what they decided on was a poster um, that the state government of Missouri would produce at no cost to the family organization. And those posters then were, the idea was shared with Kansas where um, Barbara was the, the uh, executive director at that point. And thank you, Carol, for setting that, that uh, acronym up there on the screen. And um, so Kansas and Missouri started working on this in partnership, but the state of Missouri's um, state government still was willing to fund those, those posters. And as the statewide family network then was SAMHSA was born. The statewide family networks were funded um, through SAMHSA. And the state of Missouri said, we are willing to continue to fund those posters, but we will share them with any state who wants to, any family organization who wants to use them. And they left the um, lower right-hand corner blank so that any organization could put their contact information in there. Now, Barb Scheidecker in Missouri still has copies of every one of those posters. And I am lucky enough that I have several of them that were hung on the wall in our old SAMHSA building over on Chokecherry. And they, those, those posters evoke so much of an emotional attachment to not only the poster, but the what was going on at the time, um, the families who were involved, um, the organizations um, who were there. And then from there, after all of the posters were up and available, there were several family organizations through the statewide family networks and other organizations who decided, I remember one in particular, they went to their McDon their local McDonald's and McDonald's, um, their placemats at the time, they had trays with placemats and they printed, made copies of those posters on placemats um, for Children's Mental Health Week uh, and that McDonald's had those posters for, well, as long as they lasted. They started on Children's Mental Health Week, but they went through as much of May as they um, had, uh, had, had the mats available. Another one of the organizations went to their leading grocery store chain and that grocery store chain uh, printed the, that year's poster on their paper bags for the grocery store. And another one, they didn't print them on the bag, they had them as an insert. Um, there was another one where the church um, that the organization was working with um, made an insert for the Sunday Bulletin out of those posters. So those posters have meant a whole lot to um, all of the families. And when you see one of those posters, when you've been around, you know, I mean, it immediately, you know that that's one of the Children's Mental Health Week posters and it takes you back to, oh, I remember that year. Oh, I remember what was going on. Oh, I remember why that was the theme. Um, and it was all about 
um, bringing awareness to everyone um, that family organizations could reach out to around the importance of children's mental, mental health. So that's how it started, was the state government in Missouri being um, kind enough to foot the bill for anyone across the nation who wanted to use the poster. And then the posters, um, the family organizations could use in any way that they felt was appropriate. And like I say, mats at McDonald's, grocery bags in stores, inserts in churches. So there were a lot of ways in which families used those and brought a lot of awareness to the issues of, around children's mental health. What an exciting beginning. And how wonderful the state of Missouri to do that. Yes. That's what a good partnership that turned out to be. Absolutely. And it was a it was a long-term relationship between Kansas and Missouri. And then along came the Green Ribbon campaign and the Green Ribbons got added to it. And so it has been a long and evolving um, long-term relationship. Wow. Now, one other question before I ask Carol uh, for some comments, I, and, and I'm using you as my historian, Liz. Do you have any idea who who came up with the idea of the Green Ribbon? Um, I don't have a I don't have a person in in uh, particular. So if there's anybody out there who does know who who uh, that idea belongs to, um, I would love to uh, to know that answer also. Uh, but I don't know of anyone in particular. I just know that um, when we got our monthly box from the Federation at the end of April, there was always a bag of green ribbons in it for us to give away and or um, we all sat down at tables across the country with uh, spools of green ribbon from uh, a craft store and uh, made up all kinds of those green ribbons. And in fact, somewhere, Carol, in all of the things that I left, there is a bag of green ribbons um, that it is left from one of our activities. So yeah, the green ribbons have been a longstanding uh, symbol. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have. They're a wonderful symbol. Mm -hmm. So, Carol, when you came um, to our family org in Kentucky, how far had the were you there in the beginning? I, I don't. I'm not exactly sure when you guys actually became an organization. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, Kentucky Partnership for Families and Children was the statewide family network in Kentucky, and um, they got the grant, and by the time they got offices and things, it was early 99, and they had a different director for about six months, and then I was there for 24, over 24 years, and now they have their third director. Wow. Yeah. And were, did you guys get to use the posters? Were you guys up and running then, or was that later? We must have been later than that. I never remember getting the posters or having the posters. Um, by then, I think everything was on internet. And, you know, it wasn't like it's on internet now after COVID, but like before COVID, right. where right. you at least sent out pics and uh, JPEGs and all that kind of stuff. So that's where we grabbed a lot of stuff at that point. Right. And you look lovely in your green today. Yeah, I'm wearing green every day for the month of May on yes. work day. <laughs> that's my goal and I have not found your green ribbons yet Liz so all righty um, I don't know who has it. <laughs> maybe they'll show up <laughs> so for many 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 years up until just recently the the campaign was an awareness campaign and we have recently in in talking with our families and our affiliates across the country we got the message that we needed to move past awareness and that our children and families really need to be accepted. Um, Carol, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. How, how, how does that make a difference for you and your children? Oh, I think it makes a huge difference. And what I've said, once that wording changed, Linda, what my thing was is that 
before COVID, a lot of people really weren't even aware of children's mental health. They kind of didn't believe in that. And so the one good thing that came out of COVID in my thoughts or opinions is that all of a sudden children's mental health has come to all the people. It's become such an awareness. So now it's not about focusing on the awareness. awareness. People have gotten aware because of COVID. So now it's about moving to the next step of acceptance. And I think that's important because um, we know that for recovery, those connections are so important. And if you're not accepting those of us who might have a behavioral health challenge or for our kids, it's so hard to watch them not be accepted and so painful as a parent that moving toward acceptance and having people start to accept and start to understand, even if it's just a little bit, makes such a difference for our kids and for our families. Yes, I I certainly do agree. And we are learning from families and from their children that this makes a huge difference for them. Um, it's one thing, it, as we thought about this, our philosophy was in talking with folks that awareness is more passive. I can be aware of many, many things, but acceptance, then that's a more active state. I have made a conscious decision and I, I do think that we are headed in the right direction with this. Um, I'd love to hear from both of you when you think about acceptance and, and uh, Kelsey, maybe we could pull up the slide that Carol did that is just so lovely. Um, so Carol, why don't you, before I ask my question, walk us through this. Okay, so when Linda asked me to speak today, I kind of sat around and thought about things like I always do. I always call it letting it roll around in my head for a while. And so as I started to think about it, and I looked at the other words that uh, the Federation has, because it was awareness, then it was acceptance and act, advocate and act. And as I started looking at these words, it made me think about the stages of change. And many of us as parents or as uh, persons with lived experience will remember back to the days of pre-contemplation. You know, it wasn't until 85 that I think the cast that Liz talked about came about that even nationally we recognized children could have mental health issues. But even in those early days, the blame and shame put on to parents or to the loved ones of that family member, you know, that they weren't even contemplating that a person could really, or a child could have some of these mental health issues. It was really about blaming and shaming the parents or the family members. And then when we got to um, awareness, you know, then they're thinking about it when they get to awareness, but they're still not accepting, still a lot of that blame and shame. And when you get to contemplation, then you're starting to move toward acceptance. So you're realizing, like Linda said, that you're making that active decision of, oh, I get it. Not like we get it as parents, but like people start to at least accept that, yeah, this is this is a real deal. We can't always help it. Um, and you can't always just sit around and blame people and point fingers. Um, and so when I looked at the other words that the Federation had, like advocacy, and so really that's where we're moving toward is how do we make preparations as, as advocates in the field to make that plan to help this become um, social justice? And that was one of the things Linda and the National Federation of Families had at their conference last year. It was focused on social justice. And I loved that because I've always thought of this work as social justice. And that's where we need to get moving to. And so that preparation of making an advocacy plan and then putting that plan in action so that we actually move forward beyond awareness, beyond acceptance, so that we're act doing active advocacy um, and then, of course, we want to have maintenance, which, you know, we get there and the new world of behavioral health is we just meet people where they're at. Everybody understands. We try to make sure people get what they need. And as always, as people and as systems, what goes around comes back around and you go back to those old behaviors sometimes and systems do that also. And we as advocates have to continue to be there to continue holding those systems to move forward and hold that accountability. So those were my thoughts, Linda, as I was thinking about this. And I thought your thoughts were 
Right on target, Carol. I really appreciate you putting that together to sort of center what we're talking about today. Liz, I, I would ask you as a mom and family member, if we had been more actively accepting of our children and families, how would that have affected your life, do you think? Well, I, I have shared openly that for, for my family and as I've watched across the nation for a majority of other families, that, that diagnosis of a mental health issue brings a whole world of isolation for families that um, your child is the one who's not invited to birthday parties. Your child is the one who doesn't get invited to a sleepover. Um, in our situation, um, our child was the one who um, during confirmation or during first communion and confirmation was like, uh, we don't know that we can withhold communion or confirmation, but we'll all be really happy when this is over because um, it's really difficult to um, to do with your son what we are expecting the other students um, to do. So he spent a lot of time um, isolated in the, uh, actually they use the sanctuary as a place of punishment for him. You know, if you can't, if you can't sit down, if you can't be quiet, you're going to have to go to the sanctuary and sit alone um, and uh, have a conversation with God about your behavior. And so there were, there were no places for him. And as a result for our family, where, where we felt like there was any acceptance of this is, this is, um, what our day-to-day -day life looks like. And um, if you are in a place of, of blaming and shaming, like Carol said, then you're not a place where we can go to for help, um, for support, for trust. And um, it just becomes a much smaller and narrower circle of people um, that you let in your life. So it would have been much different. Um, and, and that's true, even for your, to your extended family. There are places where we wouldn't go because it was just um, family members didn't, didn't understand that, um, no, I can't stay in the house and, and chat with you. Um, if he's going to be outside, I need to be outside with him because um, – I don't know what your yard has to offer. And um, so it's a safety issue for him. It's a safety issue for us. I don't want him breaking something accidentally. Um, so even family get togethers were, um, were a real struggle. So it's the isolation that would have, have been different. Yes. I, I want to ask both of you to reflect about your children did you get the sense from them that they realized they were being isolated and they were not fully accepted? Well, I will speak for my family and for TJ. TJ absolutely knew um, that he was not being accepted. Um, he came home in junior high and he, he was being disciplined in the principal's office for having used language that was inappropriate in the hallway. And um, so this is a kid with a written learning disability who was being punished by the principal um, with an assignment for a two page um, paper on why his behavior was inappropriate. How, how was the behavior inappropriate in the school? And so I said, OK, TJ, I will be your secretary. You just you tell me out loud and then I will write it down and then we can type it together. And he said, OK, I'll agree to do that, mom, as long as <clears throat> you understand. I am being punished because 
I said something that a teacher didn't like, even though <clears throat> between every class in the hallway, you can hear that same word being used by um, the jocks, being used by other people, and they never get punished for it. This particular teacher took exception. And so I'm being punished because <laughs> they want to make a point. So yeah, he he knew even when he was very little, um, the school's policy on taking medication. Um, he was the only kid who had to go to the front of the room uh, and ask the teacher for his medication uh, before they went to lunch. Um, so yeah, he he knew from the very very beginning. Um, as soon as he got into the public school system, um, he knew that he was different. He knew that he wasn't getting invited to the same things that other people got invited to. Um, so, yeah, it, he he was fully aware. Yeah, uh, for my family, it was the same way, Linda. My two older boys that brought us into the world of children's mental health, we adopted through the special needs foster care program in our state, and they are full biological siblings. But the trauma and all the things they had gone through, and they were with the same foster family for five years, and I don't know if in that environment they felt that different. I'm not sure. But when we adopted them and moved them and we stayed in contact with the foster family the whole time. But now there were lots of things that made them different, not just their behavioral health challenges, but the trauma that they experienced, the family that they lost and loved. So now they've lost two families they love. So there were a lot of things that kind of added all to it. Um but I think they definitely knew it. Um, one caused a lot of chaos in school all the time. Very planned, very purposeful. He knew what he was doing. Um, and then the, the, my oldest one, it broke my heart because in high school, he really didn't have anybody to hang out with at all. So what he would do is he'd find the group in the parking lot who's passing out their parents' drugs and he would take them and he'd be the guinea pig because he would rather be the guinea pig and have them laugh at him than to have no one to stand with outside the high school. And so he really struggled for a long time and they both ended up dropping out. I got them to 18. Once they turned 18, they both ended up dropping out, which broke my heart, but I got it. My son said, if I keep going, I'm going to keep doing stupid things like this. I think I'm going to have to drop out of school, mom. And it was probably one of the healthiest choices he made, even though it's affected, you know, his ability to have jobs as an adult but yeah it was it was a bad spot to have to be in for an 18 year old and as we're talking those of you who are listening and joining us today please please feel very encouraged to share your experiences in the chat any comments you have uh, we know it's not just the three of us who uh, have raised children navigating systems so please uh, feel free to join us and we will be watching that chat. Now, Carol, I'm wondering now, are you seeing the tide turn it off for your children? Do you, it, are, we, are we getting anywhere or is it just like it's been? I think it's gotten better. It still has a long way to go in my opinion. Um, I, my younger children that are my biological children, uh, both have some very mild behavioral health anxiety, a um, little bit of depression, but it was not nearly severe behaviorally. And so they had a much easier way to go with it. Um, but like I said, I do think, and I think part of it is the youth movement that we've had across the country. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I know at uh, Kentucky Partnership for Families and Children, where I worked at previously, having our youth move council, our Kentucky youth move, and where they would come together. And that's the only place they had a true peer group. So I think things like that have really tremendously helped our kids because they might go to school and have a group to hang out with, but it might not be, they might have to put on a big mask to be there. Mm -hmm. When they get with other kids that understand bipolar, schizophrenia, uh, severe anxiety, depression, all of those things, substance use, I mean, all of a sudden, it's very different in how they see themselves and how much they start to accept themselves a lot of times. So I think that youth movement that started 
with the statewide family network grants, probably thank to, thanks to Liz adding on when I first started, I think it was $10,000 on to your statewide family network grant for youth activities. And that's when we started our statewide youth council. And it still goes on today as a youth move state chapter. But those are the types of things I think have helped our kids and their families tremendously. Yes, I agree. I, it's so exciting to watch our young people who are taking ownership of their destiny and, and are claiming their true selves. Um, it's, it's very different uh, than it was years ago, but it's interesting. Even you know, I watch my son and his friends and my son's older now. So I'm speaking about a few years ago, but listening to them, and this is boys, you know, boys don't tend to be as uh, willing to talk about things, but listening to them talk so thoughtfully about one another when someone was experiencing a mental health challenge, um, it really was such a good thing to see. And it continues. And, and I'm watching them as adults and they're very close friends. And that's continuing. They still look out for one another's mental health and making sure that everyone is in a good place. So I, and I do think that our youth movement has made a huge, huge difference in that. Um, now, Carol said something, and of course, I love this idea of social justice for our families. Liz, I'm gonna come back to you uh, because I know we've talked about uh, your experience and I'm gonna ask you to reflect on social justice and what that means to our families. Um, why is that important? Well, I think that during, for me personally, um, during COVID, uh, it became more and more and more obvious um, the differences between the haves and the have nots and the social injustice um, that we saw across the country for families who had children with mental health issues. There were two things in particular. One was because kids were being, children were being homeschooled um, and everyone was learning remotely. And depending on the neighborhood that you lived in, you either had access to the internet or you didn't or you had a broad bandwidth of accessibility, or you had a very narrow one. There were some families who had to load up their kids and it was um, an adult and a carload of kids sitting in the parking lot of a library so that they could access the internet. Um, those families who had one computer and four kids, and there was only, only one way for one kid to be on the computer at a time. And so the other kids were being either counted absent or tardy or, del or um, and over time, what we saw happening, and in some places it was very deliberate, in other places, I think that people just didn't think it through well, um, was that these, the kids who did not have access to a computer did not have access to the internet those kids were um reported to um as truant mm -hmm. and so they would get put over in the juvenile justice system as truant the moment that happened their families were then um their names were sent over to child welfare because they were delinquent in making sure that their child was getting an education. Now, that didn't happen willy-nilly. In some places, it was very well thought out that this was an opportunity for schools not to have to educate those kids. It was like, oh my God, we've got a chance to... Uh, set them up as being truant and they become somebody else's problem, not ours. And so I think that that part of social justice around how do some kids get treated and others do not is one that is huge. And now that, that students are being taught back in the classroom, you look at who are the kids who didn't come back? Who are the kids that didn't graduate? 
and our kids are a majority of those. The other thing is that as what I watched happening across the country um, was again, the, the isolation of, of families during COVID and now coming back, there are several kids who have, de have developed school-based anxieties and they're not able to come back to the classroom. The other thing that in the, one of the other systems that, uh, well, it happens in schools, but it happens in hospitals, it happens um, in foster care, is the issue of seclusion and restraint. And seclusion and restraint in schools has been an issue that um, we have been dealing with for as long as families have been talking to each other. But what's happening now is that we are seeing more and more children who are being treated um, with seclusion and re medical restraint, pharmaceutical restraint in hospitals in ways that never happened before. And right now, the early research that um, we have available to us show that um, children of color, especially boys, are being um, treated in emergency rooms with pharmaceuticals at a much higher rate um, as a way to um, restrain them than any other population. So to me, those are the social justice issues that um, if we aren't talking to each other about what's happening in our schools, if we're not talking about what's happening in um, all of the systems across those that touch our children, um, they can very easily go under the radar screen because it's not something that uh, people talk about. Um, it's not something that people have any reason to know about. I remember one of the last meetings that I was involved in at SAMHSA and I was talking about seclusion and restraint in emergency rooms with pharmaceuticals and people were looking at me and, and their jaws dropped open and they said, what? And I said, this is happening every single day across our country. And until we start bringing attention to it and shutting a light on it, um, your neighbor is never gonna know that that's what's happening to your child. So. Yeah, those issues of social justice to me are really, really important in the day-to-day -day life of families who are raising children uh, and they're raising them with the, with every ounce of energy they have, but the, the um, systems are not helpful. Very, very well said, Liz. Um, I, I do think that we as a movement have got to wrap our arms around this notion of social justice. Carol, I know this is a very important uh, platform for you. And I'm wondering for your children, has social has that impacted your children and their lives? Have you seen them in situations where you didn't feel that social justice was being um, Absolutely. As equitable as it needed to be. Absolutely. And I think that's what made me an advocate when when things weren't being followed for their IEP. And I'm a former special ed teacher. And I was like, this is not the law. Uh, that special ed teacher and I, she apologized and we became very good friends and are still friends 35 years later. But I was like, I know the rules are about special ed. So just even from things like that, not following the educational law, not... um. You know, like Liz talked about the juvenile justice and those things um, or sending our kids home every day from school, but not writing it down as an expulsion for the day or suspension for the day. So then they can do it unlimited number of days where if they expelled them or suspended them, they'd have to do um, a background thing on was that related to their disability. So the disability finding they'd have to, and most, I know in our state, and I think most states are this way, there's only a certain number of days you can expel a child or suspend a child. And so when you look at some of those things, you know, it happens across the board in almost probably every agency that provides services to families. 
And that's not to say that every agency is a bad agency. Nobody goes into this work as, you know, my husband is a social worker. He's retired from years. Nobody goes into this work. I was a special ed teacher. We don't go into this because we're going to make big money. We do it because we want to help. We want to make a difference for others. Um, but I think sometimes people get co-opted into the system on all the systems. And then sometimes those services really affect our kids getting the justice and the equality and equity they deserve because of their behaviors. Some of them are hard to like, and that's <laughs> taken out very frequently uh, and on so them. And I think Liz's example of uh, TJ and saying the word at school, somebody else can say it, but because they're a good kid most of the time, they don't irritate people. They don't call that kid out, but our kids oftentimes irritate people quite frequently. And so it's like, we just want to get them out of here. So we're going to send them home and they're going to have to do this, or we're going to call into uh, the court system because they've had truancies or they've shoplifted where the kid right next to them shoplifted, but doesn't have that behavioral health history. So we see that all the time, I think, with our kids. Yes. And if you're reading the chat, you're seeing that we have many people on this call who are having these same experiences. Uh, I think for me, and, and I don't believe I was naive because I've worked in these systems all my life, but with my own son, it was having my trust destroyed in systems. Um, I think I, I, I felt systems were fairer and uh, more evenly balanced than I found them to be. And I think it's difficult once you lose that trust to work in partnership um, with a system. And, and it looks like in reading the chat that certainly many of us have had those experiences. It's, it's an emotional train wreck when your trust is destroyed. And um, I don't think our systems realize that. Um, Liz, I did want to ask you on this topic of social justice and justice in general and acceptance. I know that TJ uh, was in the military. How did you as a parent find that experience for him? When TJ was born, he was born with pyloric stenosis and with uh, a um, a heart and cardiac um, issues, and they were well documented. And so I thought, well, I have nothing to worry about. This is a he's got enough issues that, um, and he had been diagnosed with. Um, he was in special ed. Um, he was on an IEP. He had taken medication for ADHD. I thought, you know, this is, they're never going to take him. And so, but that was the only thing he talked about from the time he was little. If, if my attachments for, for my vacuum cleaner went missing, it was because TJ was using them as a weapon um with his sisters it was like everything was a gun and so um he wanted in the worst way to be in the military from the time he was very very little and our family is filled with uh, military veterans so he grew up around and the people that he looked up to were people who had served in the military and all three of our kids went to school every summer so that they can um, graduate. Well, they're either making up classes or they're trying to graduate early. And so all three of our kids went to summer school so they could graduate at Christmas time instead of May. And um, so during his the last part of his junior year, he asked me if I would go to the recruiter with him. And I said, sure, I thought, there's no risk to this. I know they're not going to take him. So sure. We went to the recruiter and one of the things that they, that anybody who is looking at the military has to do is they have to take what's called an ASVAB test. And I don't even know what that acronym stands for, but it gives you a score 
um, that the military uses to then look at what are the jobs you would be good with and in. Um, and so TJ came back with an ASVAB score of 111. And it was like the recruiter was sal salivating. It was like, oh, my God, this is the this is the kid we want. And I'm going, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Um, and I had said to TJ, TJ, I will go with you, but I need to know, can I be honest with the recruiter about all of the things that I think might be an issue? And he said, yes. So I looked at him and I said, TJ, may I talk about the things that I'm concerned about? And he said, sure. So I looked at the recruiter and I said, um, well, the first thing that you need to know is that TJ has a heart murmur. And so I'm not sure that um, he is going to be a good candidate. And the recruiter said, oh, well, he'll have, he'll have a physical and we'll see what comes out of that. And I said, well, and he's also on an IEP at school because he has a written language disability. And the recruiter said, well, what does that mean? In plain language, what does that mean? And I said, if you can read phonetically, you will have no problem reading what TJ writes. But if you can't read phonetically, it's going to look like he's writing an, a foreign language. And he looked at me and he said, so we don't make him the general speech writer. <laughs> I said, okay. And I said, and um, he's been on medication. And he said, has he taken it in the last six months? And I said, no. And he said, well, then we don't have to worry about it. It took five waivers and it went all the way up to the Surgeon General of the Army to sign off on these waivers. And the last one they were waiting for, I said, I, I said to TJ, have you heard anything from the recruiter? And he said, um, yeah, they're waiting for my dental health waiver. I said, a dental health waiver? What's wrong with your teeth? He said, I don't know, but that's what he told me they're waiting for. And um, so we went to the recruiter's office and I said, what, what dental health waiver are you waiting for? And he looked at me and he said, we're not waiting for any dental health waiver. He said, we're waiting for a mental health waiver. <laughs> and I said, this is, the, this is where my son did not realize that mental health had a stigma in the greater society. It was like a mental health waiver never crossed his mind. A dental health waiver, he could figure out, but a mental health waiver never crossed his mind. Well, they got five waivers and, and TJ and even the physical, the one time that his um, cardiac testing came back with no issues. And it was like, oh my God. So he went into the military um, as the rest of his, his class was graduating in May, TJ was already in uh, boot camp. And he loved it. He thrived. It was the place where there were rules. There was a schedule. There was a routine. You knew what to expect. You knew what to do. And he thrived. He loved it. Um, and then he graduated from there and AIT and um, went into the, uh, to the military and ran into people just like had been in school. And um, his behavior was not anything that they knew anything about. They didn't know how to deal with it. They didn't know how to um, ask questions to clarify. It was all about um, you either fit in or you're punished, one or the other. And, um, and so regular army, he, he had, he was there for two contracts and, um, and then he, um, and then he died in Iraq in 2003 while he was serving overseas. Um, so was it a, it was what he wanted to do. And in the end, my husband said, Liz, don't be the one that crushes his dream. He wants to be in the military. Let them tell him that he can't. Um, and so um, 
And as long as I, it, I think TJ was early on, probably was one of the first um, recruits that had a cell phone. Uh, there were many, many, many of them who would never even have thought about owning a cell phone back at that point. But as long as he could call and we could talk at the end of the day, um, he got through and got up the next morning and did it all over again. But when we weren't able to do that, um, it just, it didn't, when he got to Iraq, they were some of the first troops with boots on the ground. There was no communication. Um, and so the only way that we could get things back and forth was by mail. And it took two weeks for things to get there and two weeks to get back and two weeks for us to send things to him. And so it was, um, it was not good. And, um, so yeah, it was, it was a dream for him. Um, it just wasn't a good fit. That story is so fabulous, and I know I've heard you share it several times, and it it always continues to make me stop and just think more about the work we're doing. Um, Carol, I would ask you. You've you've moved from Kentucky to the national stage on a daily basis. And you were so amazing in Kentucky. And I know you're going to be just as amazing on the national stage. But with a national perspective, and I know you've only been there a couple of weeks, but what recommendations would you give to the group we have convened here today about how we can continue to elevate this message of acceptance? I just think keep doing the things you're doing, Linda, for one. I think in our Office of Recovery, um, we have many people with lived experience and different types of lived experience. And the focus really is on recovery and not just substance use recovery. It's focused on mental health and substance use recovery, um, which was very important to me when I accepted the job because my, I have kids that have both uh, mental health and co-occurring with mental health and substance use. And so to me, it was very important that recovery focused on both of those things, not just one of those things. But I also think that the Office of Recovery is very open to hearing what's working and what's not working and helping families and, and uh, your loved ones get to recovery. So I would say keep doing the types of things you're doing. I know um, the Statewide Family Network grantees. I know um, Fred Blood, the Family Run Executive Director Leadership Association, the National Federation of Families. I mean, all these groups are really working hard for that awareness and that acceptance. And I think you just got to keep doing it and make sure we've been talking at work the other day about how you got to kind of raise those behind you. And we've been talking about this in Kentucky for a long time because uh, my co-director, Barb Green, and I, we were getting older. We we're like, we got to bring up some of these babies so they can take over when we need to move on. And that's what Liz did to me. So she was my mentor. She helped me build my skills over the past 24 and a half years. So then when she left, she knew somebody could come in and have a lot of learning to do, but but could carry that voice still. So I think that's part of what we have to continue to do as a movement of family and youth or people that are working in the field is we have to continue sharing our voice, sharing our truth and and paying attention to social justice. You know, Carol, you're reminding me, Carol and I were in a meeting the last two days together, a very exciting meeting, and there was a woman in this meeting who continued to use the phrase about, I'm preparing the way for those who step through the door after me. And that just, that just resonated with me because she painted such a visual picture of, okay, we're at the table and we're doing all we can do at the table, but what about those who are getting ready to come through the door? How do we make sure there's a place for them at the table? And how do we make sure that they are as accepted as, as 
they should be. It was it was just a very uh, empowering uh, visual picture that she painted. And I'm going to try to hold on to that and remember that as we're working, that there are people at the door, coming through the door, and, and we must prepare them. Um, Liz, you have had such a rich history and you have been such a mentor to me. As you look at where we have been back when those first posters were done and where we are today, what are your thoughts? What, what would you want to share with this group? Well, I think one of the really significant changes um, that has happened for families is the use of social media, that there is less of a sense of isolation because social media brings people into each other's living rooms and gives people an opportunity to share pieces of their life that they might not otherwise share. That 35 years ago, um, none of that, uh, you really did feel like, oh my God, my family is the only one that's going through this. Um, and then we started talking to each other and we found out, oh, that's not true. There's lots of us out there. Um, but it was still, you had to pick up the phone um, if you wanted to talk to another family member that didn't live in your immediate community. Um, so I think that the that social media is probably the biggest change and um, it can be used for good or evil, but um, I am very thrilled when I see it being used for um, the good of families and lessening the isolation that they um, are experiencing and feeling. One of the frustrations that I feel is that um, I very often hear or would, would get calls when I um, transferred over to the Office of Recovery and families were dealing with the same questions that we were dealing with 35 years ago. <laughs> and so it's like this big circle that we're coming back to and do we have younger families who are in a position to step through that door with support and encouragement? Um, I know that if you look at the leaders from 35 years ago, we used to sit and look at each other and say, we only want to make sure that the families coming behind us do not have to experience what we have experienced. And in some ways, in reflecting on that, since I've retired, I have, I have looked at, you know, maybe we've done a little bit of a disservice um, to those families because it's like watching a butterfly come out of a chrysalis. Um, if you help that butterfly by taking that chrysalis apart for them so that they can emerge sooner and faster and in a safer way, um, you'll kill the butterfly. They need that struggle of getting out of that chrysalis before they can thrive. And I think that sometimes we have done too much for, as opposed to let me walk alongside of you. Um, we were in a position where we did not want families to suffer like we had struggled. And so we thought, making a system that was better so they never ever experienced it was was the key. I think instead we need to be very careful that we walk alongside of families, that we we provide everything that we can in the way of support, advocacy, and education, but that we not take the chrysalis away. That chrysalis is there for a reason. And Strong leadership comes from experience and sometimes it's a, a struggle. Um, so that would be my, that would be my um, reflection is that we, social media has been a good thing. 35 years of questions have come for full circle. And um, I think that we are here in a way that we can support families as they come up through the ranks of leadership. 
Beautifully yeah. said. Yeah. I want to thank all of you for being with us today. Um, we really just wanted to get together and pass the torch from Liz to Carol. Um, Liz, I know you are available. <laughs> I, I count on that as, as we move forward. And Carol, we are so excited to see you in this position and continuing the work that Liz has been doing for the last 35 years. Uh, so with that, we will give you back your afternoon. Thank you for being with us. Um, please uh, pay attention to the Children's Mental Health Acceptance Week activities that are going on. And please, if you can join us for our conference this year, we will be continuing to speak about Social justice, this is a platform that we feel very strongly about at the National Federation, and we would love to have you join us in Orlando in November. You can see the information on the screen and you can check our website. Have a wonderful rest of your day and we will be talking with you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.